right, hello everyone, and welcome to the third episode. Today we have a very exciting guest. George, if you want to tell us how you are related to the University of Oxford, what your experience so far or was, and what you're working on right now. Yeah, sure. Peace, everybody. Uh, my name is George Hofstetter. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a tech company based in America and California called GH Tech Incorporated. Um, I was a summer program student at the University of Oxford in Worcester College and then at Hughes Hall at uh, the University of Cambridge. Um, but yeah, that's where I met uh, this good brother Rick on the gardens at Worcester uh, as I was filming a documentary, actually, that will be premiering in Oxford within the next two months. It's called From Oakland to Oxbridge. That is a fantastic title, and um, I look forward to seeing the documentary. Yeah, it was really wild that um, I was there at a well-being conference, um, helping move things around, and we just struck up a conversation, and here we are. Um, how was it at Oxford and uh, the other place? Uh, we'll start with the better of the two. Man, I have to say, um, I went in biased uh, to Cambridge because I had such a wonderful time in Oxford. Um, this is so correct. I, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, yeah, Oxford definitely holds a special place in my heart. Um, man, uh, my experience, I would say one of the biggest things that I noticed, at least with the first week, um, was it's uh, hmm, college students around the world outside of America do a great job of understanding that they're global citizens, right? Like they have a, a global context uh, to speak to uh, and that's what they learn from. Now in America, I, you know, it was really frustrating to see that I had limitations with like regional context. When I would talk about certain stuff, um, I realized that a lot of it was uh, regional based and I was really, I was confused and it, it took me a minute to understand that uh, American education does an incredible job of centering America to make it feel like we're the center of the world. So when we go out of it and we speak to um, other uni students around the world that have a, a depth of knowledge on like a few subjects, while American students have like a, a breadth of knowledge on a few things, we don't have that depth of knowledge that you all have because we're not pushing out like five essays a week. That's mm. not what we're focused on. Um, so that was really, really interesting. And I thought it was super inspiring um, because it, it removes like the entitlement from the individual and focuses on the larger community at hand that like my actions as an individual actually impact the world, no matter how small hmm. it is. Uh, Americans have this like disgusting entitlement that feels as if if we do something here, it only affects us, and that, and that's it. You know, I think it's also an effect of like uh, American capitalism that like breeds individualism. Um, but yeah, that was initially. Mm, my first there's there's a lot to unpack there, but th that, yeah. that's very very cool. So um, to in response to a f uh, to the one of the points that you made, mm. um, you feel that um, in the United Kingdom at Oxbridge, most students will study three, maybe four subjects in a given term, but in mm. great depth. Whereas it's my understanding that in most US uh, colleges, you'll have a sort of catalog of courses. And if you want a particular degree, then it's your job to meet those requirements. But it's almost like a um, buffet kind of situation where as long as things don't overlap, you can put together pretty much any program that you so choose, provided yes. it meets the criteria. And so you can exactly. sort of Lego block build what you want to do. Exactly. Which is, you know, it has its pros to it as well, because you get to like mix and mingle and you get to meet a lot of folks with a lot of different interests and a lot of different passions. But, you know, we're not having that depth of knowledge that you all have. I can't, I can't, I can think of so many times that I was in the pub in Ox and so many people would like spit out facts and statistics about like three different things, just broad. And American students, I can think, I can probably count on my hand how many university students I know that have that depth of knowledge. And they're probably not undergrad, they're probably postgrad um, doctorate students or well deep into their masters to be able to have In that 
you know, knowledge to call upon just because it's not as in depth. It really is that breadth. We're, we're talking surface level breadth. That's very interesting in that um, it's my understanding that for the first universities in New England, their mm-hmm. graduate schools were modeled on the Oxbridge undergraduate system. Mm-hmm. And yet um, the Ivy League chose to develop an undergraduate program that was quite unique in those choices that it offers. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure what the history behind liberal arts colleges is, whether or not they were there from conception or whether or not that was something that developed later, because mm-hmm. the whole idea of a liberal arts program um, in essence, is to give you a very wide foundation that doesn't actually manifest into a particular profession. It's there to liberate you from ignorance or something like that, such that you're familiar with your culture's past. You can speak the ancient languages, interface with the texts, so mm. that you're no longer reliant on someone to interpret the past of your nation or your culture, but you yourself can make your opinion about epic literature and scientific achievements. Whereas in Oxford, I, I guess uh, they didn't go in for that, <laughs> or at least <laughs> there there is classics, there is the um, lettres humanitas, but that's a particular degree that someone specializes in. It, the con of the specialization in the United Kingdom is that with some exceptions, if you want to be a doctor, you have to decide that at 16. In the US, it's my understanding that you to get to med school, you first need to do a bachelor's degree, and it's helpful to do one that's at least somewhat related, like mm-hmm. biomedical sciences or biology. But fundamentally, the idea behind um, schools of business, medicine, and law is that they want a more mature individual who's committed to that very lengthy and um, grueling process. Whereas in the United Kingdom, you, you lock that in early. And if you're yeah. having a second doubt, sucks to suck. Yeah. <laughs> Man, yeah, no, I can't imagine that. That's making those big decisions like consistently and having to stick to it um, that young, you know, uh, it's, it's commendable. But I can imagine how it feels very, uh, I, I don't know, isolating and probably very restrictive. So I can see how folks would be like, oh, American students, you can choose you can choose from so much. You know, the opportunity is endless. But uh, like that buffet is, you know, you can't uh, bite off more than you can chew. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good point. Um, within that sort of comparison, how in a buffet you can load up your plate and no one's going to stop you, but then you realize that oh oh, these two things don't go together, and I can't really eat this, and now I just have student debt, and it mm-hmm. and it escalates. Literally, literally it's uh, American overconsumption for sure. Mm, mm. Well, I the first undergraduate degree that I did was in Russia, of all places. And wow. there you have very little choices with respect to the curricula. Um, the way that it works is you pick a degree and then the government decides what the syllabus for that degree should be at all universities. And the elite ones as well, or the highly rated, whatever the term is, um, also have to adhere to that. And there's a bit of wriggle room, but fundamentally we were doing something like... Um, 12 subjects a semester there were two each year and it was insane it was um from maybe 7 30 a.m to roughly 5 p.m six days a week nuts this is very different and i think i had on my transcript it has one elective there were a few choices but of 3800 hours of a four-year undergraduate degree there was one subject i got to pick And that was it. So that's like the extreme version. If the US is on the one extreme and then Russia is on the other, the United Kingdom kind of is in the middle because in your second and third year for most Oxbridge degrees, you can really choose different specializations and build it together. It's still a set list, but um, two people doing the same undergrad program might have very different experiences. there's a, a finite number of options and configurations rather than US where it's really, really sort of customizable. And then in Russia, it's just, you're doing this. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. that sounds so like rigid. That sounds super rigid. Yeah, It I, is, I, it I, is. And did you, it, like it? Did you appreciate it? Um, well, the way it happened was I 
won a few competitions in writing and poetry. And so I had it in my mind that I wanted to do literature. And okay. my parents had it in my mind that uh, that was not okay. So they said, do econ in Russia of all places. This is the equivalent of being sent to military school uh, to straighten me out. And I did that. And initially I wasn't too happy with it, but they reasoned that if I do that, I can do whatever I want for the rest of my life. And if things mm -hmm. go poorly, then I can fall back on a econ degree. Yeah. Um, but fundamentally, there came a point when I realized that, look, I'm here and um, there are way worse ways to be locked into a four year commitment. I could be in prison unfairly. <laughs> this is way better. And even if it isn't precisely what I'd like to be doing, I can get yeah. some value out of it. And then I ended up going to Oxford. Yeah. So yeah. it right worked out for me, but it was rough in the beginning. Yeah, no, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. It sounds uh, like a very strong story. It sounds like you had a lot of silver linings that you <laughs> had to focus on, you know. Um, cause you got to motivate yourself really to, to get up at the, to get up in the morning, you know, but fundamentally, I think it was a positive experience now that I'm out of it. I wouldn't want to go back there again to relive it, but, yeah. um, a, it made me more appreciative of the Anglo-Saxon system and B, it was also, um, I guess it, it gave me a certain rigor and discipline that you just had to show up and endure. Mm. And, um, Further, um, for a lot of the degrees, you had to do at least two foreign languages. For mine, it was at least one. And until recently, you just got two random languages assigned that the government needed specialists in. And if you don't want to do Portuguese and Swahili, well, sucks to suck. You're doing it for four to six years. And then you go off. And the idea was that 80% of the spots at that university were paid for by the government. They would pay you to study. But since you were the one that, or rather, the government was paying you to study for mm -hmm. what they needed, mm -hmm. what your interests are doesn't really matter. Provided you are competent, welcome aboard, you're learning this language. Whereas in the US, it seems to be an inversion. No one really needs you to become a doctor besides a few maybe scholarships or sponsored programs. You mm -hmm. get to decide as the student what it is that you want to do. And then whether or not there's a spot waiting for you at the other side is a big if. Now, everybody wants to be yeah, an actor. Yeah. So go ahead, go to film school, go to acting school. But then as to whether or not someone will, and you have to pay for it. No one's going to pay for yeah, you to do it. This is true. And then at the other end, no one wants to hire you because there's too many or there aren't enough opportunities. And so it's, they're almost sort of the reciprocal. Yeah, no, I, I can see that, you know, um, I haven't heard of it from, from that perspective before. Um, but I can definitely speak to the, the level of accessibility, um, and how restricted opportunities are, uh, after college, especially like, let's say you decide not to get a four year degree. Let's say you're, you're just working, go to a trade school. Um, you're quite literally trailblazing your own path, you know, um, unless it's nepotism, you know, um, and that's just mm. universal across <laughs> around the world. Um, yeah, it is. It, un it's unfortunate, but it's just rampant. It's, <laughs> yeah. Legacy. Part of it's human nature and part of it's just lack of oversight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that, that I pay attention to a lot is, when folks go into school, what is the rhetoric around when you leave, you know? And I think at least the United States economy, the way, the, the way it's crumbling right now is that the majority of students have over a hundred thousand dollars in debt when you leave a four year. Mm. And how can you like, how do I even break it down? I would start, I would have to start with the loans, you know, let's say you're in high school, right? So you finish school, um, you're applying to university and you have all of these financial institutions that are like vultures that are like preying on you. You have no idea what credit is. You have no idea what like uh, the what the structure fundamentals of a loan is. Um, but you know that you're broke and you know that you need an education for a degree. And you know that if you don't have that degree, it's going to be much harder, so to speak, uh, to to get an opportunity that pays well enough to live comfortably, let alone survive um, under American mm. capitalism. So these, all these vultures from these financial institutions are like, here, you can sign this. We'll, we'll give you a full ride quote. You know, we'll give you like $80,000 right now. So you're saying that if I sign this piece of paper, 
I have no money in my bank account, but you'll be able to fund my education for four years and then I have to pay it off. Okay. That sounds like a good idea because then I'll get a job. Imagine how predatory that is for folks that have no financial literacy at all, you know, and especially you, when like these predators are preying on the, the oppressed communities of color that have an incredible lack of access to understand that this is a system, like this is a trap that was designed um, for you to stay in debt, you know? Um, it's insane. I it think that with it, oh, sorry, do go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's, it's ridiculous, man. So then when you're in school, you have this like this, uh, this cloud over you. That's like, okay, you, you got to stay here because you just signed that commitment, you know? Um, and then when you leave, now you got to work however many hours to pay off the debt and you're not living comfortable, you know, you're surviving. Um, and I don't think education should be a place where you have to survive. I notice students that are very well off, that are wealthy. Um, they, they have fun learning. I think learning should be fun. I enjoy my time learning, but it's a lot harder to enjoy your time learning and to be passionate about a subject when um, you're focusing on surviving, you know? Um, and that, that's, that's been my experience. Uh, and Americans, America's education system, noticing the, the different dynamics um, between different communities in school and how they, whether, you know, are exposed to that access and can advocate for themselves and the ones that are like, I don't want to bite the hand, bite the hand that feeds me. Yeah, that's absolutely. I mean, when it comes to consent in sexual matters, we understand to some degree that prior to a certain age, your brain is not developed to the point where you're able to wrestle with these complex topics. Yeah. Likewise, alcohol, drugs, gambling, contractual agreements of many na of many kinds, mm -hmm. whether those laws weren't originally formulated with the idea of the prefrontal cortex um, in mind, no pun intended, but that's the crux of it, that beyond uh, prior to a certain age, it is biologically difficult or impossible to really take seriously events in the future and bargain with the future and plan not only for tomorrow, but where will I be several years down the line? Yeah. And to create the single kind of debt which can't be forgiven, the one that you can't remove from with bankruptcy yeah. to the for the individuals that are the least neurophysiologically disposed to plan mm -hmm. about the future is evil. It's it morally evil. Exactly. Because that is already a difficult thing, or let's say a morally unjust thing to do for adults who have the full cognitive capacity to at least partially place themselves in the future, which is a difficult thing to do when you think about it cognitive uh, from the perspective of cognitive psychology. And then to get these children with the carrot dangling of, if you don't get an education, where are your opportunities going to be? You'll have no future. You'll, you know, all your peers will be ahead of you. Look how fun college is. And then yeah. ah, you just have to sign here and you can yeah. worry about that later, later. because you're going to make it big a hundred percent. You'll just make it big. And that will be for <laughs> you to worry about later. And then, and then it happens. And then you got people that have to pay off immense debt. I've seen yeah. Reddit posts from people who are in $800,000 figure, or that in that ballpark mm. and they drop out of med school and then that's it because yeah. what yeah. profession are they going to get that then pays that off yeah exactly and you're taking yeah. young people who are supposed to be the future of your nation the it's people who are supposed to take your nation into the future and yeah. you're burdening them with that colossal debt yeah it's, it's definitely it's some yeah. shackles you're shackling them you know they're like stay here we need you to do this you know um, but, you know, I, I don't think Americans education system or educational system breeds critical thinkers. You know, I don't think that was the goal. I don't think they were ever like, you know, what, we're trying to educate the masses to think for themselves and, you know, recreate, build their own mm. systems, you know, take control of their lives and uh, positively impact their communities. If that was the goal, you know, we probably would have universal health care. But that's just not America's goal, you know. Profit over people. It's American capitalism. They 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 love that divide and conquer. So uh, I can't imagine them ever wanting to like really genuinely fund the education of critical thinkers in this nation. 
Although you know, fundamentally, actually, even those, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, you know, that, that brings uh, a thought to my thought to my mind. I was, I remember my tutor, my tutor is a DPhil student in Oxford and she invited me uh, along with the other, um, you know, my other peers to the pub and we were doing, um, what was it? Well, a tutorial submission. Right. And she, I was just confused as to why, like, it feels like learning never stops there, you know, um, in, in a, an American college, I feel when I go to a class as a class, when I go home, that's home, you know, I'll have designated time to do work. Um, while I was in Oxbridge, it was literally like, there's no pause. It's continuous. And I think that was the, and that's what she mentioned is the, like, when you're at a pub and you're having social conversation, you should be talking about what you just worked on. You know, the learning is continuous. It doesn't need to stop at specific times. Um, that's the the rigorous piece. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, but yeah, it just really, it really emphasized the contrast that I was used to. Mm, from the US where there is that split, like you said, of study and home yeah, and there's that no sort way of wider would, net that doesn't go deeper. Exactly. There's no way I, you would catch me like 8 p.m., 9 p.m. I'm out with my professor talking about an essay that I wrote. Why would I do that on my free time? There's no like it just it didn't make sense. It didn't compute over there. It was like, of course, like, of course. So that was um, a very interesting experience. It was enlightening. And so am I correct in understanding that in the United States, your alma mater is uh, Stanford University? That's correct? Yeah, I go to, uh, I'm a university innovation fellow at Stanford where I teach in the Hassel Platner Institute of Design, um, a workshop series <clears throat> called Invisible Designers. Uh, we focus on three things, radical inclusivity, community development, and hacktivism. Um, and when I was in Oxford, I wrote for the, uh, the Oxford Blue, the, the newspaper, and I, I spoke specifically about like my efforts in hacktivism in the UK and uh, some of the contrast to um, my work in America and the like intersectionalities between them. Um, but yeah, I started teaching that winter quarter of 2021 at Stanford. Oh wow! This is this this is good because I was aware that you were doing student, you were in the capacity of a student at Oxford University, mm-hmm. but um, I didn't realize that you were teaching full courses at Stanford. That's very very incredible. Um, I did see the article the in the Oxford Blue mm-hmm. that um recounted the rather negative experience. I mean that's yeah. understating it. That was at Oxford. Um, yeah. Do you want to speak to some degree about that? I know it's probably not the sort of the most pleasant subject matter, but it's also quite important. Yeah, no, it's very important. It's very important. Um, so this, um, this happened in, in Cambridge at Hughes Hall. I was at a formal dinner and I was uh, in Oxford. I was the only, I was one of two black people in my program. Um, this is including African indigenous descent. So one of two in my program of maybe like I want to say a hundred, maybe 150 students. And then in Cambridge, there's probably about 50 or 60 of us. And I'm the only black or African descent. And during this dinner for folks, I guess this, this is Oxford um, audience. So they understand the formal dinner and the halls and stuff, but we were there huge halls. Right. And um, chopping it up with some of some friends that I've met just recently. I've just moved in, yeah, that first week and having the dinner, um, laughing. Someone sends uh, an airdrop, like an anonymous airdrop, and it says, I hate niggas. And I was like, huh? I was like, what? So then I accept it. And then it's a picture of George Floyd. And then I was like, oh, whoa. I was like, what's going on? This is a very serious message that someone just sent. And I start looking around 
And I'm like, did you get this? Did you get this? And they're like, oh, let me check my phone. And they got, everyone got it, you know? Um, so I, I look at the professors at the high table and I'm like, I stand up, did you guys get this? And they're like, oh, what is this? Like, oh, it's so disgusting. So then, you know, I address everybody and I'm like, excuse me, did everyone just receive this? And then, you know, the whispers of like, yeah, 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 yeah. Or and some people are like, it was disgusting. And then the folks that were laughing in the corners, were silent. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the professors were trying to figure out what to do, how to find this person. And I was like, dude, it's an iPhone. So it has, it, or it's an airdrop. So it has to be from an Apple device. I don't see anyone with an iPad. So it's gotta be an iPhone. Collect all the iPhones, do process of elimination. And then they try to do that. And then, um, you know, they get stuck after a few devices. And then I'm just like, man, I, I just don't trust anybody in the room to figure out who it is. You know, as the only black person, I felt like this message was a, like, it was a direct message to me, you know? And, and not I think to one can be pretty confident. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was like, let's say for shits and giggles, let's say, excuse my language. Let's say they choose any other black person, black American that was murdered at the hands of the police, uh, a white supremacist institution that was born out of slavery, right? A neo-colonial system that's literally built to oppress, which is the policing system in America. They choose someone else not that doesn't have the same first name as me. It would still be a very significant message being sent. But if you're choosing the same, the, the same first name, like what more of a target can you send you know um so that's when i started and as i was processing it sitting there seeing everybody like squirm and whisper and not have any like i don't know tangible organization and figuring out who it is i was like wow yeah i'm the only one here so i'm the only one that's gonna hold anybody accountable because y'all aren't used to this y'all aren't used to having these like intense conversations um might not have the vocabulary or exposure to education to like have the book, have the vocabulary to speak to what's going on, to contextualize the experience for everybody. So I realized that, um, that I had to, you know, take matters into my own hands. So I told everybody, you guys have 30 minutes to confess. Um, the professors, instructors in the room, you have 30 minutes to figure out who it is, go look at the security footage, do whatever you need to do. But within that 30 minute time frame, if no one's found, I'm just gonna take my laptop and then hack into Hughes Hall network and then trace the image back to the device. Cause it was quite simple, like conceptually. So I was like, I just know that's gonna be my end all be all. Like I know that's the absolute truth when I get my laptop. So I'll, I'll give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Nobody said anything. They couldn't find the student, so you know, I stand up, give everybody one last warning. Nobody says anything. So I go to my room, my dorm, take the laptop out, sit back down in a corner, trace the IP address, cross-reference the image properties. And then I find the student's device. And then I walk over to him and I say, um, you know, like, are you ready to tell everybody that it was you? And he didn't question once if I was right or wrong. He looked at me and his face got super red. Um, and yeah, he was like, yep, I'm so sorry. I'm ready to apologize. And then he stands up and I bring him to the front of the room. And then we just have a lecture. You know, I, I, can, I ask him a lot of questions about his understanding of like the socioeconomic conditions Black Americans are under, what he thinks of the police murdering George Floyd means. What does it mean to my community? Um, has he ever been to America? Um, and then I ask about the Black Panther political party that was formed in Oakland, California. If anyone was aware of them, nobody knew them. And I was like, whoa. So then I start breaking it down and I go into like systemic oppression and how it can be completely um, spearheaded through technology um, and how it can be uh, uh, the just the amount of increased negative impact that technology can have um, with a specific demographic when it's backed by this like white supremacist institution that is like American capitalism, overconsumption, et cetera. Um, and the dangers of anonymity within technology and social media, the ability to think that you can say anything in the world and nobody's gonna hold you accountable for it. 
Um, so I break, but, and like I said, this is just me being me. It's not like I'm doing something, anything out of the ordinary, like everyone in the room thought, everyone thought this was just such an incredible like spectacle that folks started taking photos with me after. Um, but this is a regular day. You know, I literally teach this at Stanford. Like I go over hacktivism skills and we talk about how do we like separate bias when engineers are developing technology products for everybody to use in the world. And so this was quite literally just like a, turn it into like a, a, a very intense and intimate fireside chat with the rest of the, hmm. the students in Cambridge. And, you know, uh, he gave a very condescending apology he was taken away by the end of my talk. The one of the the course instructors comes in, and the lead course instructor, and he was like, "I know who did it." And I was like, "Man, I'm sorry, brother. Like, we already figured it out. Like, he's right here." And hand off to dude. He leaves the room. Everyone goes standing ovation. I sit down, and now I'm like super overstimulated, and I'm like, "Whoa! Like, let me process. Just went down. Let me go step outside, have a glass of water." Um, but it was just like people following me for the rest of the night. So I was like, man, like, I appreciate y'all, but I'm going to need to take some time. So I'm going to go back to my dorm. I'm going to go like journal and reflect. Um, and folks, my folks in my like cohort, they were, um, very inclusive, you know, very supportive. They were like, okay, cool. Like do your thing. Take your time, you know, like that was crazy. We got folks crying in some corners, folks not knowing like what's going on. They can't put words to the experience. Uh, I'm just very calm throughout the whole thing because I know that I need to take care of myself and protect my peace, you know. So, yeah, that was it. Go back to my room. And then the next day, it was as if um, it's like you could slice the tension with a knife, you know, and that nobody knew how to like address me or like talk to me or um yeah, they were just confused. Interesting. So people sure were walking on eggshells when they were talking to you. Yeah, exactly. And it, it took them probably two days to like get back to normal, quote unquote. Um, and why do you think that w was it perhaps this idea that um, for everyone else involved, no one really, um, they sort of left it to you to take responsibility for the event, even though you were a guest? Or was yeah. there perhaps some sort of idea that they had never encountered such a thing and weren't able to sort of figure out what the procedure was to keep going? and Or what do you think it was yeah. that led to that tension? I think it was a mixture of both for sure, probably leaning more to your end um, in the sense of they've never experienced something like this. Like I would have, like in, a, in an American, like let's say this happened at Stanford, right? And oh, we're having like a dinner or something. Someone would come up someone would probably come up to me and be like, yo, like, are you, you don't want to take this outside? Like something, you know what I mean? Not like physically take outside, but I mean, like, are you sure you want to do this in front of everybody? Like there would have been some type of mitigation at some point with an instructor. Mm. You know? um, and the instructors just, they were just in awe, silent mouths open just listening to everything that I said when I was at, when I was at the, uh, at the top of the tables. Right. Uh, but, and then it, it hit me. I was like, they've never seen anything like this. Like they've never had, or they maybe read about it, maybe like heard stories, but like to have a, a significant, like, um, like digital racist attack to their only student of color, um, or the only black African descent student. Right and them not have protocols to find this person. They don't know what to do when they have them. What now? What are the consequences? You know, what are the follow up? No, I didn't even get like a, like a meeting after I had to reach out and be like, Hey, so what's the word? Like, can we meet? What's up with the student? Did he leave? Uh, you know, I, hmm. I so that's what I mean. I, I don't think there was a lot of, um, strategy set up behind it at all i think it's very used to getting like shoved under the rug and like i could have just laughed and like cried in my room or something and then nothing would have ever came from it you know but that's just not where i'm from that is not my personality that is not my uh that's just not what i'm about you know that's not what i stand for 
I have all these tattoos on me for a reason. They're like symbols to remind me, you know, stand up for what you believe in your community. So, yeah. No, absolutely. And it was an interesting decision you made that, or rather very admirable, interesting doesn't do it justice. It's very admirable that rather than responding with fury or trying to report this person immediately, there was a dialogue that you offered. Um, and because you teach this, presumably you've put a lot of thought into what the best procedure is to dealing with someone who does this sort of thing. What was going through your mind when you decided to sort of choose to take it? You sort of put the ball mm -hmm. into his court by yeah. educating, by explaining the context within what he sent to you and what that signifies yeah. with your experience and with your community. Yeah. Um, I, I Nothing was really going through my head until after the fact to keep it a whole, like, to keep it honest, you know. Um, I felt like it was like fight or flight mode. So, like, I was just adrenaline the whole time. I wasn't necessarily, like, looking at anybody. I was just like, I know what I need to do. I'm going to do this. Now we're going to have this conversation and I know what I need to say. You know, it was like reverse psychology. Like I'm asking you questions that I can almost guess you probably don't know the answer to. Um, and I'm like trying to like point holes in his logic just to show everybody that, you know, he's not relatively conscious, you know. Um, and <laughs> that's just, that was just fundamentally an issue, you know. Um, so that's what was going through my head. It was more of like, I know what I need to do, you know? But like one thing I think I mentioned in the article, oh, actually two things. One thing I mentioned in the article, I went to James Baldwin when he spoke at the Cambridge Union um, years, years ago, over 50 years ago. And he had that incredible debate where he won arguing was the American dream um, achieved at the expense of the American Negro. In a room full of like white Europeans, the only person of color, only American, and he won. I thought that was mad inspiring as an openly queer black man back then. That's incredible to be a lone wolf there and um, like stay confident, plant those seeds of, uh, of genius and curiosity there for, uh, for generations to come. So me having to, me having experienced that space the day prior, right? being in that space, understanding the significance, um, and just like reveling, like marveling in that like black excellence. It was uh, very, very inspiring. It was liberating. And then what I didn't mention in the article, li the, the way I got to the Cambridge Union was I had a meeting with the, uh, with Dr. Hut Dr. Hutchings. Um, she's the director of the Cambridge Center for Cybercrime that she started uh, over 10 years ago. And we got to talk about how algorithms that are used by the university um, are predatory and like significantly negatively affect communities of color that are applying to get into specific colleges there. Um, and they just started to figure out how to refine those algorithms um, so they're not as disproportionately negative to communities of color. I thought that was insane. You know, it was, um, it, I thought that was insane because now I'm contextualizing the experience with technology and its negative impacts to com oppress communities around the world, you know, at these high level institutions, whether it's Stanford, whether it's uh, UC Berkeley, whether it's um, Oxford or Cambridge. Now I'm like looking at these statistics and hearing from someone who runs the center. So having that experience, meeting her, um, and then going to the union and then immediately after uh, we have that formal and that happens. So I felt like it was almost like un unintentional preparation. Now, that's that's profound. I mean, it's uh, severely it's a negative experience. It's an awful experience. But within that context, it does seem profound. And mm -hmm. as a consequence of the way that you chose to deal with it, the fact that a, you were able to use your knowledge of technology to identify this person, and B, that rather than immediately um, and quite justifiably um, mm -hmm. going into just saying, you need to get this person out of here, you took it upon yourself to explain that um, in the hopes that this person would come around and then offer a sincere apology or at least yeah. recognize the fact that what they did 
they were fundamentally uninformed about what it is that they were conveying to you. And yeah, um, exactly. it's quite unfortunate that the person decided to choose neither of those options. <laughs> yeah. um, Man. It's and, been my experience. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Do, do go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I felt like it was the response that they weren't expecting. You know, I was, mm. that's one thing that I thought of after I was, you know, I was thinking about it and I was like, what was the message that they would have expected me to respond with? And it wasn't the one that I did, you know? So that, that was one of the things that I, that I definitely uh, would say I'm proud of understanding that this was like a, it was like a carrot. Like the carrot stick, it was like, "What are you gonna do? Hmm. What are you gonna do?" I was like, "Not what you think," but I'm gonna still make a statement. Uh, that, that's fascinating because um, over the past few years, I've tried to do a lot of reading outside of my econ and psych degrees, and one of the things that I'm interested in is sort of um, both the history of the Soviet Union because it's, it comprises a half of my heritage on my mother's side, and also the history of evil. And a recurring theme that I noticed, uh, for instance, in Solzhenitsyn's uh, Gulag Archipelago, where he describes um, in four tomes, I've only made my way through the abridged so far, he describes this system of concentration camps that would split mm. like an archipelago of these islands nested within the territory of the Soviet Union. Um, Solzhenitsyn recounts how the only people who were able to withstand this system and were able to overcome it were the people who, just as you said, didn't cooperate, didn't play along the rules that were given them to them. One of the most harrowing experiences I had was I was in the um, metro in Moscow mm -hmm. and I was reading on my phone this particular passage where Solzhenitsyn describes a woman who got out of the uh, train and two men said, um, we've got a th event that we'd like you to go do. And immediately everybody there was perpetually afraid. She understood what this was. And a lot of people in that situation, including Solzhenitsyn, who was a decorated soldier who still got put into the gulag, a lot of people would think, oh, if I make any noise, I'll only make it worse for myself. Surely mm. I'm a good citizen of the Union, of the Soviet Union, therefore, not the Cambridge Union, <laughs> certainly I'm a fantastic um, citizen. This is just a misunderstanding. And if I make any noises, then that will actually work against me. Mm. Not this lady. She immediately started yelling. She immediately started screaming. She was flailing her limbs around and saying, someone help me. Can you believe this? These scoundrels. And they yeah. let her go because mm -hmm. they weren't expecting that. They yeah. were expecting her to just silently sit there. And Solzhenitsyn himself somewhat, he, he almost beats himself up to my memory of how he got to the station and then they put him into a temporary cell. And the whole time he was just saying, oh, you know, this is going to end soon. You know, mm -hmm. he was afraid to take like many others. And the point that he stresses is that in it, the fundamental trap is believing that either inaction or pure reflex will get one out of a situation when actually taking a stand and taking that um, initiative mm -hmm. to do that, that which isn't expected to not cooperate along the lines and cooperate either by reacting in a way that's expected or by simply not reacting at all. The mm. other example that comes to mind is in Siberia, um, there was a group of nuns from a old uh, Orthodox Russian, this was sort of um, a separate uh, denomination that was very, very old fashioned and um, ancient. And the guards asked them to swap out their uniforms to from their traditional clothes to um, numbered sort of prisoners' clothing. And this was in maybe minus 30 degrees Celsius, sorry, something like minus 40 Fahrenheit is minus 40 Celsius. Very cold. And when the guards said they should do that, they refused to. And then they compelled them again and again. And so all of these nuns took off their clothes and just stood there naked. And they started doing the day's labor naked. And wow. they kept this up for several hours until the guards felt so bad that they let them wear their traditional garbs. And they stayed like that for their entire internment until they were freed. Wow. It was, and the recurring theme is that there's just a refusal to follow along those lines. Yeah. Um, you can't accept and so it's striking that that. You can't accept what's like status quo and what you have to accept. Closed mouths don't get fed. Mm, mm. Yeah, and it's and it's very unintuitive in that there isn't a guidebook for doing this. It's very frightening, and it's a theme that's recurred in Viktor Frankl's um, 
um, man's search for meaning. It's I was watching the Gandhi movie last night, which was insane. It's such an incredible movie, and that's essentially what Gandhi preached: of not he doesn't participate in the system. He's in uh, when he's being trialed. I, I, you've seen the movie? No, no. I'm asking if it's good. I, I feel oh, like oh, I, I, th- I thought you said it was good. Um, it's phenomenal. It's a fa- it's okay. very large. It has an intermission. It's that old school, but it's phenomenal. Got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But there's a particular scene when in India, Gandhi is being trialed yet again, and he was educated as a lawyer, I believe at Oxbridge. And um, he says on what charges, and obviously the judge is flustered because he can't, he understands that he's the agent of a system that is no longer functioning for the purpose it was built for. Yeah. And then he says, I'm leaving you, I'll put you on um, um, bail for a hundred rupees. And then Gandhi says, I'm not paying a hundred rupees. And he says, you know... I, I order this and he says, I'm not doing that. And the judge just doesn't know how to react because that's not one of the available options in his mind. Yeah. I don't know. So it's, I, I didn't mean to bring genocide into this, into this already negative experience that you had, but it's just what it made me think of was that uh, idea of systems. Yeah. Um, I'm a yeah. big fan of Dave Chappelle's comedy, even though the guy uses a few eyebrows no, no, nowadays. I love Dave. I love Dave. Shout out Dave. Yeah. Breaking barriers. Um, but like you said, yeah, he's like, incredible. Genocide. I won't even speak to that. The intersectionalities of what we're talking about is a direct link to genocide, direct link to transatlantic slave trade, direct link to British and American imperialism and colonial superpowers. So yeah, it's not too far off. It, I mean, it, it rests upon the idea that every person's heart is capable of evil and that it's a progressive, um, iterative thing where one second a person is merely participating in a functional system and then day by day they allow these small evils to build up without ever and deceiving themselves that they're doing the right thing and then eventually before they realize it it's Mm. german soldiers who are telling themselves this is in um ordinary men that if they were paired up initially to kill these Jewish people in Poland, that yeah, if they shot yeah. the mother, then They're it would be okay to shoot the kid since the kid yeah. wouldn't survive. And that that was the right thing to the do. Just a bit. Yeah, no, exactly. I actually watched this incredible documentary on Hitler. Um, it's on um, Amazon Prime. And I thought, I've watched a few docs on it. And this one I think was so well done because they talk about Hollywood's perception and romanticization of Hitler, you know, and how a lot of productions around that give him humanity when there's no acceptable reason to ever give this man, um, you know, humanity on screen. Um, And there was a point that you said just now that really, really made me remember it. And it was towards the end. And it was a historian. Oh, man, Freed's. I have to remember his name. This old, um, oh, where was he from? He was he was Russian, and he studied the he studied Hitler and the Nazis his whole life, right? And he's done incredible work. He's giving this talk. He's giving a lecture at a university in where is it? I think it was France. I think it was France. I think it was Paris. And he says one of the things that people have such a struggle, like such a difficulty accepting is that the Nazis were human. Humans are all capable Mm. of that level of evil. It's the fact that we're trying to rationalize crazy. You know, he was like, you can't rationalize crazy. It's not possible. But you have to recognize that these are humans that are doing some evil, sick stuff. And it's just, you can't put it past anybody. Any human can get corrupted to be doing some incredibly evil stuff. Um, but recognize that it's not an anomaly. And I was like, huh, you know, there's always that, the romanticization of like, wow, this was an anomaly that occurred. That was, that's insane. There must be some extra piece that we don't know, or there's, that's missing the mystery that like X factor that belongs in a movie or in Hollywood per se, when it's not that at all. He's like, man, you got to recognize that that is not it. And um, I thought that was incredibly um, profound, you know, um, because it, it made a lot of sense. It made a lot of sense. Um, before I before we get off, I want to make sure that I, I, I give his name because that was an incredible documentary, man. Really, really well done. Mm. 
So, and, and when you say before you get off, would you rather me, um, would you rather like place that in the notes later on, or do you just want to check that now? Or uh, I'm checking right now, but we can place it in the notes as well, just so I have it off on my head. Gotcha. Are we all right for time then? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Oh, you fantastic! Go, you go um, for like, like 15. In in for 15 more, you meant? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, then on that topic, um. I, there's a particular part in one of Super Pell's specials. I'm a massive fan of him. I think I've got the hoodie somewhere here, but I was at, uh, there was a um, show that Chris Rock and Chappelle uh, did jointly at the O2 Arena here in London a couple of weeks ago. It was insane. Oh, yeah, no, no, the big but, um, one. They brought uh, Kevin Hart, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, this one was, I don't, Hart was doing a joint thing in a few other venues, but here in London it was um, oh, okay. Chris and Chappelle and a bunch of other amazing comedians headline. Uh, uh, warming up before the headlines. Point being, in one of Chappelle's Netflix specials, mm-hmm. he mentions a slave um, in the American South who buys out his own freedom um, at the time. He was some incredibly talented worker, and so he accrued this wealth, and he was able to purchase his freedom. And then he purchased his own land, and then he purchased slaves. And then he was so cruel that adjacent white slave owners said that he was going way too far, which is insane. And the point that Chappelle makes, and he makes this in a lot of other points, I've made it a hobby to find footage on YouTube of um, little concerts that he's done or whatever, is that it was a system and there was an incentive. And the incentive was that at the time in the American slavery South, that success was owning owning slaves and being cruel to them and exerting power. And um, what I've assembled from that and... Um, the Gandhi movie, which I watched because Chappelle mentioned that it's a really influenced his thinking on that topic, is that often there's self-deception and there's progressive evil that humans commit on an individual level, but it's also the system. It's also this idea that if, that on the one hand, it's every single person that's participating in this, and mm-hmm. on the other, people are, it's sort of like taking a surface and tilting it in a direction. And if mm-hmm. that direction is um, if you're ambitious and aiming for success and you aren't protected with an education or an upbringing that teaches you certain moral values, mm-hmm. then the likelihood that a hundred people, if they're in a perverse incentive system, some of them will resist it and recognize it for what it is innately or through their upbringing. But many, because they're initially just ambitious, will follow that perverse incentive and become perverse. And and that system perpetuates it. And so I really admire the fact that in the movie, the depiction of Gandhi, I don't know the full biography, but at least in the movie, he identifies the fact that to get rid of the British through violence would be to still participate in that system. It's Mm -hmm. still this sort of intangible structure that lives Mm -hmm. in the souls, for lack of a better term, of every person, and it's reinforced. And so even if you think you're moving to a different player you're still playing chess you're still playing racist chess and the only acceptable answer is to flip the table you can't win you can't get rid of racist chess by defeating your opponent and playing a new one because you're still on that board you're Mm -hmm. still subscribing to the idea that i've got a and b and Mm -hmm. because you're still participating in it and it lives on it's an idea that lives not in one single person but in a group and so the hardest thing of all is a to encourage people to be fearless and be creative. And it's something that you can't necessarily, there's no precept for it. You can't just say in this situation, do X because yeah. often like we discussed before, it's not readily apparent. It's, and so there's that paradox of how do you teach a person to act in a way that can't be predicted and B, yeah. how do you get people to stop participating in a system to dismantle it? Because I, it's a, it's I, a shaky the, thing of trying to remove blame and say, yeah. oh, it's just a system. It isn't, but it's what yeah. molds people and contributes to their becoming evil. It paves the way. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I mean, you can reference that to uh, American and British capitalism, literally. Like it's just the, it's the highest form of imperialism, I think. Um, and you, if you're working within it, it's the, how, how do you? How do you work within it to dismantle the system? You know, there, and that's something that I'm trying to figure out right now because I would consider myself um, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist. But I do recognize that I participate in capitalism as running a business that has employees. You know, Um, but 
it's figuring out how to, how to, how do you set, how do you redefine, cultivate a, a more inclusive, um, equitable culture like around that and have actual conversation on this system is inherently violent. You know, this system is inherently dismissive and negative. That's killing folks quite literally around America um, or in America. And um, I, I'm not familiar with um, British politics as much as I should be. Um, but uh, I do know American capitalism is uh, inherently, inherently racist and discriminating and discriminatory. Um, so figuring out how to fight against that system, create your own outside of it. That's what I'm very passionate about. And that's one of the reasons, like I started the tech company for, I think utilizing technology to leverage the resource that comes with that, we can recreate um, very effective systems without the influences of uh, white supremacist. You know, like there's a lot of ways that we can utilize the tools that we have at our disposal in 2022 to flip the table. A lot of people don't want to talk about flipping the table because they're concerned with having a seat. And it's like mm. Mm. inherently going to hurt you, you know, but it's a privileged place to be able to have that point to make that point that I'm making now, because you have to have been exposed to that education politically to understand that that's not possible. You have to have spoken to, or I wouldn't say you would have to, but it would be helpful if you were to speak to some folks that have um, been suffering from the system, right? Um, that can speak to it and have, and can contest, that can contextualize their experience in a way that you'll feel. And that's how I think it changes. You, you like poking the, the empathy button on everybody and then giving them. Well, what I would posit, what I would then posit is that, um, sort of the dilemma among people who, um, to some degree or another, um, feel that this is the way that the yeah. system within which we behave economically, culturally, socially is in need of constant updating is yeah. that, um, if one completely just destroys everything and tries again, yeah. then those incentives, if they aren't labeled and identified and named mm -hmm. live in inherently in the hearts of men and women. And so there's the risk that you sort of and I'm not putting this on you, but uh, mm -hmm. the extreme example is Pol Pot started that whole year zero idea. And then immediately the sin isn't built, baked into the system. It's leaked in from the humans that are a part of it. And mm -hmm. so in my very limited experience, I have no expertise on the topic of social justice, let alone within the United States. But what I would then add, and please do criticize and sort of um, uh, provide your thoughts and insight on this, is that to improve upon a system, one has to first study it in meticulous detail and point out all of the perverse incentives and give them a name. And, and this is how it happens. This is what leads a person to go down the steps of dehumanization and what could take an already sadistic person and enable them or an otherwise well-intentioned person and transform them into a monster. And then to take that same system, and this is the incredibly difficult part, within its own confines, to then eradicate all of the perverse incentives, remember that they existed or that and how they came about and put in systems that prevent the reoccurrence. I mean, a lot of the whole idea of separation of power, the in the US we have or in the US there's executive, legislative, and judicial. In the UK, again, another contentious figure, but uh, Jordan Peterson made an interesting point. I've made um, he made a YouTube clip where he said that the UK is unique in that it has a fourth branch of power, the symbolic, and the monarch exists to a degree to keep the prime minister humble. Whereas Trump began to feel like he was king. Flotus, this idea that that the wife of the president, completely unelected, has influence of some kind. That's a monarchy, not an elected president. <laughs> yeah. And so the you know, the UK, although it is replete with many problems, mm -hmm. has a thousand years of what people call modern democracy, parliamentary democracy. That's where it was born. What the Athenians practiced with their slavery and their indenturement and their voting system was not what we would call democracy today. So the UK, in essence, is the oldest modern democracy. And what it's full of is um, the perpetual attempt to identify all of the perverse in incentives, study them, and then figure out a response. But that's painful 
because then you have to play the game and not play the game. It's much more um, appealing to just delete it entirely. But then you're just going to come right back into it because you never understood how that pathology occurred. No. And, that's inc- and that's so hard. To, it's easy for me to say because I'm still benefiting within the system. Whether or not those problems get labeled, um, yeah, yeah. I would be heartbroken, but I wouldn't be... Um, it, although if you just sit by and watch pathology spread, you're next. No matter yeah, who you are, if you let that happen, I mean. you're next. It doesn't... It, capitalism doesn't have a flavor. You know, it doesn't have... A, it's literally... It's, mm. it, it's anyone, you know? Um, and I would say... To, to enforce your point, to encourage that. I, I agree. The meticulous studying is necessary, but the process that you're talking about um, is decolonization. That's what you're talking about. Mm. That's the difficult, the uncomfortable, the pain. Um, and almost all the time in revolution, it's bloodshed. Um, but in the process of decolonizing our minds, that's that meticulous studying of our economic systems of our systems of exploitation, of carceral systems around the world, of um, prison industrial complexes, you know, um, neo-colonial structures that still enforce um, white supremacist rhetoric, you know, um, all, all of it is that, that questioning, that studying, that um, proactive organizations toward developing systems that are quite literally survival programs waiting, pending that revolution, right? That's what the Panthers were mm. talking about. That's what some some um, some organizations in America are focused on, you know? What happens when it happens? How do we pick ourselves up? How do we survive? We need community farms, you know? We need political education groups, cadres, workshops, um, free food, you know, free health care. Like there's certain systems that need to be in place in order for us to start designing for our liberation. That's just what it is. But that's what that's exactly what you're talking. That's the talking point. Well, one issue that I think the UK um, sort of people in the UK have right now is that um uh, the abolition movement in, and I spoke to this a bit on Instagram. Um, and it, every time I post something where I think, oh, people are going to assume some stuff, it never happens. There's always a long list of messages of people really going into it and figure and hashing it out. And I say, look, man, I'm wrong about 90% of the opinions, but it's, I don't know. Did you see what I posted there? Uh, yeah, William Wilberforce, and uh, oh, oh, I, I actually looked up some of it um, because I was interested, and I'm very familiar with Oleda. I think you pronounced his name. I might be butchering it. Uh, Oleado Equiano, Equiano, mm-hmm. the, the the slave that had purchased his freedom and then wrote some incredible narratives about it, about his experience and buying his freedom. Um, that was funny, actually. My first week. Uh, side note. I was my first week at Oxford, we're doing like these like um, games, right? Like to mingle. And one of the games was like, it was called Imperial. Are you familiar? Imperial. No, but please do good. This is Basically, okay. <laughs> super. It's like, wow. Yeah. Great introduction, right? Basically, you choose a British celebrity's name. I choose a British celebrity's name. A third person chooses a British celebrity's name. I guess if I guess your celebrity, you're now a part of my kingdom, so you stand next to me, and then we both decide what that person's name is. And if we get that, then he joins the kingdom, and we keep going and keep going until there's one king or one queen, right? I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, <this> is- <laughs> that's that's an incentive. Stru- that's a that's an incentive structure that that no, does mimic right. the perverse. But, but I, I suppose won. the point I'm making. Oh, sorry. Do go ahead. I was just saying I won because I chose that brother. I chose that the 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 British slave that bought his uh bought his freedom because I was like I know nobody is going to guess this. Which is that, and that's precisely the issue that um I, I have a few of my friends in um, Oxford who have very strong views in both directions, and although it sometimes gets borderline uncomfortable, I try to expose myself to everything and still speak up when necessary, but. And maintain the dialogue for as long as possible. And um, one thing that was noted by a person who's sort of um, 
English. Um, he uh, he he openly says that I look like a thousand dudes. If you just drive through the UK and you go through villages, it's just copies of me. And he has this idea that um, with the UK, resentment is festering within working class whites that feel like the issues of the rich whites are being foisted upon them. And the rich whites are like, oh yeah, we're fine now. And then they'll pay some nominal fee and pretend to be fine. And the ultim- and again, it's this broken, perverse system that's unnamed and unstudied of how it, it befalls the working class whites. The issue is that the United Kingdom isn't a mirror of the US. It's full of issues, but the issues are very different. However, it's true that the dialogue in the West has recognized that to that universities and employers and economies are now integrated. And so all of our problems are each other's problems and we have to understand each other's history. With the UK, on the one hand, slavery has been de, de jure banned since the 1500s. It was never allowed in, or there was um, Irish and Scottish indenturement, which is horrific. But with respect to outside of the UK, bringing in a slave, if they touched British soil, they became free. And then it went, f- but there were still rampant um, atrocities committed across the colonies because it was the UK territory that where slavery was banned, but, uh, but colonies were fair game. Then that changed in the mid 1800s when the abolition movement progressed and uh, Wilberforce and his colleagues. And it came to the point that there was that fleet that um, for 50 years um, patrolled West Africa and the West African area and yeah, first um, checked British ships, then Spanish, Portuguese, French, and there were then treaties with Brazil. And so Britain is the only empire that ever went out of its way to stop trading with the US to boycott slave manufactured goods and to return over 150,000. I'm reiterating just for the listeners, I apologies, <laughs> and freed over 150,000 uh, slaves. But then at the same time in 1917, there was a massacre in India when a British regiment um, fired upon um, peacefully protesting, um, I believe, um, Hindus and Muslims in India. And that was a turning point for the freedom of India. And it was a horrific event. And so it's very difficult that the atrocities of the American South and the atrocities of the British Empire are very different. And a lot of British people become resentful and eventually go down the path of radicalization because they feel like um, they want to be proud of England's abolitionism, that it was the only empire to have ever opposed slavery. But then because it's one of the only empires that still has a living, well, new monarch, but still has a monarchy, it's the one that gets pointed as of America the previous version or the America is UK 2.0 and therefore the UK is the original sinner. I would add to that point to the sense of where, at least myself, I'm not just pointing to the British empire and saying like, Oh yeah, the monarchy awful X, Y, and Z or X, Y, and Z, excuse me. Um, I would say that it's the continued perpetuation and profit off of the uh, indigenous artifacts that are still like, proudly displayed that at is, Rivers yep. or as Williams. And just recently after folks are calling for, what is it, the Rhodes Fall, Cecil Rhodes statue to get removed. And then you have like, um, what was the other one? In Jesus College, they gave a Benin bronze back to the, 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 to the Congo. Well, at the same time, they were trying to, they literally assassinated Patrice Lumumba or like literally like, um, you know, have, uh, what was it? I think it was Oriel. No, no, excuse me. I don't want to butcher it. Uh, Balliol, the, um, what is it? The master of Balliol was, was receiving, uh, what was it? The, uh, profits from a specific period of time within, I think it was the, oh man, I go read the article that I read on, uh, on the mm-hmm. Oscar, but I specifically say like, um, there were profits that Balliol was getting from the slave trade from British colonists. Um, and well, Cecil, yeah, he donated a lot to Oxford colleges for massive sure. Massive amounts. Christopher That's why Columbus, the statue was out there. Christopher Columbus donated money to um, Cambridge. You know, it's like, it's all intersectional. I think it's ridiculous, but I think that's the, I think that's the piece. It's like, it's very redundant to, to say like, I want to say redundant to say, I think it's, 
ironically redundant that the same empire that is profiting off of the slave trade is the one that's like, we need to free the slaves. You know, it's like patting yourself on the back for some sick shit. You know, that's how I feel about it. Or that's how I look at it. No, a hundred percent. I, my wish, I guess, would be that, um, that within the dialogue, all of the merit, the abolition movement in the UK is not known by many British people. Oh, I believe that. The dialogue became the wheat from the, separating the wheat from the chaff to say, here are all of the phenomenal things that the British empire did. Here are all of the awful ones. Let's do this, more of this and less of this, rather than this huge ball of just, it's all shameful, the word empire. And it, and I see the justification within that. Um, and I get, I mean, for me, um, my great grandfather, I believe if I've got the facts right, was um, an enemy of the state in the Soviet Union. And the only thing that saved him was that he was a scientist. So he got insulation, an insulated room to do his research in the Gulag. Usually um, what would happen is that when winter came, it was like a waiting game of too early or too late. Children would wait outside of cafeterias in Siberia and stab someone they think they could take to death because solitary confinement had heating. And so the older prisoners would teach children that were put in the gulag that you need to wait if it's because everybody was on edge when winter was coming because you didn't want to go on a solitary until you really had to. But they would look and see someone weak to kill to get solitary, to stay warm. My great-grandfather didn't have to do that, but that was he survived the winter. Yeah, And yet I feel, and so there's this, in, in, the Russian Federation, especially now, there's people who just say, Soviet Union was phenomenal, don't believe the lies. Stalin, great guy, killed almost as many people as he killed like 9 million people, but forget about it. Yeah. We're emotional creatures fundamentally. And so we want to have either a positive or a negative relationship to any concept or idea. But if we want to get through this thing that's called evil in the heart of any person and sort of then, and that sickness of the soul, then one has to, or at least some group of people, um, have to go into that. And even within the Soviet Union, even for a nation and a system that tried to slaughter my family, I find it necessary to go in and figure out, well, what was there about the Soviet Union that did work to the, what was there that then got carried over to the Russian Federation? Because clearly they didn't demolish the whole thing. Something, there I mean, was a building that's and dialectical. that's so painful. That's dialectical. And I it think. sounds like I'm being an apologist for the entire colonial thing. And that's not what I'm trying to do. No, no. But I, I feel think... that if you break the whole thing down, then how do you know that you're not going to build up the exact same thing in a hundred years' time? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's important to study it without the like celebratory pride and like you know inaccuracy of the majority of the history. I think a lot of it has to do with um, what you're talking about when it comes to the process of decolonizing our minds, um, acknowledging it, and then I think the other process is what are what are our practices and methodologies that are going to counter that like ingrained conditioning that we all have. Um, and then the other piece to it is the ability to step out of the individual, you know, step out of the, like my name. I think that's another thing that's um, like you said, I can't remember. You said something in this uh, a few sentences ago that made me think of, yeah, individualism, you should take some shrooms or acid and then step outside of yourself and then recognize that you're like an ant in the sense of the universe, you know? Um, because I think a lot of it has to do with the, the like individual entitlement piece, you know, um, being able to see yourself in a community and relate to it, I think is, is critical if we talk about, if, if we're having this conversation in general, you know, um, but yeah, nah, that you got me thinking about a lot for sure. Oh, that's what I was going to say about the, um, you said the, the British empire. And you were talking about the relation to the, the the British folks and the resentment that they have, right? I they think they feel as if the problems of the U.S. are just being pasted onto them when they feel like, oh, actually, we did a few things right, and we were combating slavery well before the U.S. We want the credit, and that's but then the, a um, lot. Of, and then you mm -hmm. to talk about yeah, the the dialectical piece. If we're talking about decolonization, if we're talking about breaking down like exploitive destructive systems that have been killing oppressed people for centuries, then we need to figure out what's worked for the bourgeois, for the bourgeoisie 1% to think that it's okay. And then for the folks at the very bottom to not understand what's going on at all and to not have the vocabulary to contextualize their oppression. There's this 
there's that like dichotomy, right? And I think understanding dialectical materialism, uh, which is the idea that the world is in constant motion and our material conditions are our environment, right? Our material conditions make our environment. That's really important to know because if we're uh, uh, like objectively looking at history and we're trying to create something that's equitable and that's not going to, you know, manifest into what is modern day, I think it has to be seen as rational, non-emotional, objective, scientific, like the scientific view, you know, which is dialectically materialist. Mm, to a degree, although obviously as, as a Russian, I'm biased because uh, the, the Bolsheviks took that philosophy and ran with it. But I mean, that's like saying that Nietzsche is bad because the Nazis used it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just because I think that right. the, the idea of dialectical materialism that Engels envisioned wasn't exactly when Lenin, I don't know if, you know, initially when um, they finally had a democratic vote for, this was the first time that millions of, so, well, they call them, I forget serfs or servants, but they were essentially slaves. The Russians enslaved themselves after the Mongols taught them how to do it. Um, and all of these in slaves across Russia, the um, Christiania, they uh, finally got to vote for the first time. This was incredible. Th this gigantic nation where when the Tsar gave out an edict, months later, that courier would reach the other side of Russia. And by then they'd have to release a new one. This gigantic country. And the first time they did a democratic vote with the Bolsheviks. They finally sieged. It was in St. Petersburg. It was momentous. The vote came in and the slaves had massive power because they were, they, they were in the millions and um, the Bolsheviks didn't win. So then um, they start, then the Bolsheviks disagreed with the way that they counted it. A different party came first. I believe the Bolsheviks came either the second or third and they didn't like that. And so then this argument between the delegates of the temporary government happened. And then Lenin got tired and he went on record saying that he, he left. He got all the armed guards of the Bolshevik party to stand outside. And he said, let them argue. Uh, I'm going to bed. Tomorrow we'll lock the doors and then it won't matter how they voted. And he said that on record and he just came back and he, and he just took it from them. He just took it from all of these, all of these slaves who had been promised so much. They didn't understand half of it. They put yeah. in their votes and someone counted those and then they just took it. But I don't think to the point of separating the wheat from the chaff, dialectical materialism has so much merit. And as tempting as it is, you can't allow the Nazi party to taint Nietzsche or it's important to recognize that. But Nietzsche was not an advocate for the Nazis. <laughs> yeah. Likewise, one can't allow Bolshevism to taint dialectic materialism. Exactly. And I guess my point was, how do we learn to take everything, the thousand years of parliamentary democracy that the United Kingdom created mm -hmm. and that the US inherited and then developed further in good ways and in bad ways, how do we take that system and determine um, all of the evil components of it? It's like mm -hmm. a cancer at the body. You can't just, if you kill the person, well, great. Yeah. But it's, it's so built in that mm -hmm. you have to somehow chemo to the point yeah. where the system obviously suffers but you have to try and aim to get rid of the cancer cells and keep yeah. some of the healthy cells. Exactly. It's so hard to put a society into chemo. Yeah, man, man. I think that's a great, um, I think that's a great point. I think that's a great quote. I think it's a great phrase. <laughs> I like that. Well, yeah. Cause, because that's people, people that go into chemo, some are reluctant to do it. I, I have fortunately my dad, um, he, he survived some pretty gruesome stuff when I was very young or before I was even born, it was very, very long ago. But I know that many people don't want to go through chemo because obviously you lose your hair, you're, you're on the brink of death, it's, but it's the only way to get through. Yeah, so I suppose the dialogue with the poor whites and the dialogue with the, um, which is a disparaging term I use comedically from Chappelle's work. I don't want anyone to listen to this. And, and <laughs> I, as my family, my Russian family and my Lutonite British family, Apologies for that. As we were talking about exploitative systems, an underpaid Amazon worker delivered my goods at a convenient rate for, rather than me shopping with a small business. So anyway, um, high and mighty. My Ludenite side and my Soviet side allow me to speak as an emissary of the poor whites. But I mean, I say that jokingly. I'm not familiar with the vicissitudes of modern Englanders who are being told they're all evil profiteers. But then in the north of England, people are skipping meals. And then they're being told that it's, it's of... And so you have to ask... How do you get people to voluntarily 
let their society and their lives and their households enter chemo. Yeah, because the convincing yeah. is once you get to the other side, it will be better for you and for me and for everyone. We'll all be big. You'll be big. I'll be big. The rising tide lifts all boats. But that's a very hard sail because there's still that massive majority of the privileged, for lack of a better term, although it's imprecise, that feel like they're going to lose their last clenches, that they live in the trailer parks and th yeah. they're the evil ones. And then if they, uh, if all of these social changes happen, that's it, game over. And yeah. that's not necessarily the case. It's there's not. that beautiful quote in 836, the Chappelle special that's not at all comedic. It, well, it has moments, but it's a phenomenal, it's a masterpiece. And he mentions that, I'm not going to do it justice, that for hundreds of years, you all thought that if we were at, we, the black community, were ever able to be in the position that you were in, we would do to you what you did to us. Yeah. But then when things got slightly bad, all the Trumpers went out to the rotunda and smeared their own shit across it. Yeah. That's all it took. Did the African Americans ever do that? No. Because and then to quote Chappelle, because we if it had worked, we would have done it already. Yeah. It's and that's his profundity. I can't, there's so much within that. But, but it is, there's a lack of trust. All of the people that would actually benefit from improving society feel like this is the last item that they have. They're at home refusing to go to chemotherapy because, well, this is what I've got left. When really, it's like the Chinese finger trap. You push your fingers together and do the exact final thing that you, you do the exact opposite of what you think will get you out of the predicament. Yeah. And then you get out. That's the you only know, way. But to do really that, you have to trust it's really interesting to hear you reference the Dave Chappelle special um, about the African American, um, uh, you know, dichotomy with the like the Trump supporters doing the uh, January sixth insurrection and reference it to the British the British dynamic too. I think that's really really interesting, and I do I do believe it profound, and I think that a lot of it has to do with this. Uh, false reality that has been, um, you know, cultivated, uh, whether it's in Britain or um, across the pond. Uh, in, in America, you know, it's the American dream, right? Like that uh, that Baldwin so eloquently delivered at the Cambridge Union. Um, the American dream is false. It's a myth. Um, the idea of whiteness is a myth. What is white? You know, like that. It's just not a thing. So this reality, this identity that's been cultivated, this fake reality that so many people have like identified with for years that have like have such an emotional attachment to is quite legitimately false. So it's like telling everybody to remove your history. Like that's not you, but what is me is the question, right? So I think that's like a, a fundamental issue that folks have to grapple with specifically the dominant culture, um, at least in America to even begin the conversation. And that's how Baldwin started the debate. He said, I can't talk about the American dream. I can't talk about racism. I can't talk about white supremacy without recognizing this false identity, which is white. And then he mm. goes off and talks. And I was that's like- That's non-participation. He's not participating in that false in system. system. Exactly. Moving away from the chessboard. You can't, you can't. Um, but yeah. Man, this has been a great conversation, man. It's good talking to you again. I'm glad we could record it this time. No, absolutely. And uh, I'm really grateful for this incredible opportunity to speak about this. I'm not at all versed in these matters. I'm an admirer of many writers and authors, and, um, and I'm a great admirer of Dave Chappelle. I think I've listened to The Closer something like 50 times on repeat just to, it's, it's, in, it's a masterpiece. Yeah, um, no I'm part. sure I'll make a lot of enemies for saying that, but I'll also make a lot of friends. But um, no, it's been a great privilege to speak with you. And um, I'd love to do it again if you're ever available. And thank you so much for being patient with me as I'm very uninformed about the history of the United States no with respect worries. to social justice. No worries. No, it's been great. It's been a, a great opportunity to talk with you again. Um, and I do want to add, you know, um, when I'm back in Oxford, hopefully we can get some panels set. We can get some more um, students out, maybe do the student forum. I'm always open to collaboration, especially when I'm on when I'm around campus. Um, but I will be, um, for anyone that is, you know, loosely affiliated with the other place, <laughs> I'll be speaking to <laughs> we'll, we'll allow it. We'll allow mention of the other place. They're not too bad sometimes. Well, well, considering events, one of them is definitely <laughs> too <events>. bad. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, I, I will be speaking to the Cambridge Tech and Society group um, sometime in mid to late October. Um, and we'll be doing the premiere in Oxford, not the other place, um, sooner than <laughs> later. So uh, I'll definitely keep you posted so we can get some folks out. No, oh, 100%. And for folks mm -hmm. that are interested in, you know, finding a bit more context on myself or the work that I do, there's a TED Talk that I gave about three years ago. Um, it's called How, uh, uh, what, man, that's a shame. I forgot the title of it. Uh, how technology redefined can be a social justice superpower. Um, so talked a little bit about the decolonization process within the education systems in the United States and how technology can be utilized to create an equitable one. Um, but yeah, check that one out too and read the article. Let's get some views. Absolutely. And if you want to plug any of your social media, your I you've got a link tree. Um Yeah, yeah. Just shoot I'll, uh, I'll post that down in the description below. Perfect. Yeah. At hyphy underscore G is my personal at G H Tech INC on both Twitter and Instagram is the business account. Um but yeah, if you Google George Hofstetter, you can jump into the rabbit hole, which is like my public political education and social justice work with the intersectionality of technology. That's incredible. It's so admirable to once you have a rabbit hole, that's how you know you're doing well. If you have a, if your own works includes a rabbit hole, you're doing well. <laughs> it's very, it's incredible. Yeah. Man, thank you, man. I appreciate you. No, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing the documentary and I look forward to um, having more conversations. Thank you so much. And um, I hope you have a great day, man. Man, thank you. You too. Peace. See ya.